this is a distinct pleasure for me. Uh, Professor Henning Shilgerin is my PhD advisor uh, at Columbia University. This is always a pleasure, uh, things I've learned from him. Uh, I am using that in my professional life, even today at Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Lab. So always a distinct pleasure to introduce my, my advisor, uh, Professor Henning Shilgerin. Uh, who is a Levi Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He was an MTS at at and Bell Labs, Associate Department Head at GMD Focus in Germany, and before he joined Computer Science at Columbia. Um, he has both joint appointment to Computer Science and Electrical Engineering, in fact. Among other things, uh, he served the Chair for Department of Computer Science from 2004 to 2009. He was an Engineering Fellow. Uh, technology advisor. He also had a stint as a chief uh, technology officer at the FCC uh, from 2010 to 2017 um, altogether. And 2019, 2020, he worked as a technology fellow in US Senate. Uh, he is a fellow of ACM and IEEE. Uh, he has actually given a lot of talks in IEEE conferences, uh, in, including 5G Wall Forum. Received the New York City's Mayor's Award for Excellence in Science and Technology, uh, the voice of Net Pioneer Award, TCC Service Award, IEEE Internet Award, uh, Region 1, William Terry Award for Lifetime Distinguished Service, uh, University of Massachusetts Computer Science Outstanding Alumni Recognition. He's also a member of Internet Hall of Fame. Um, most importantly, uh, he has developed the protocols like SIP, RTP, RTSP, which uh, we all use today uh, for voice over IP and uh, internet telephony. So in, in that regards, uh, He's often known as the father of internet telephony. So you listen to the father of internet, and then we had interesting talk from NASA. Uh, now let's see, uh, Professor Shulgerin uh, has something to talk about internet. How can you make it um, digitally, you know, the digital inclusion, right? How do you make sure the internet is all pervasive? Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand it over to Professor Shulgerin uh, for the last uh, invited talk for today. Thank, Thank you. you much. Uh, I will switch sharing if I don't mind. So thank you for sticking around uh, late into the evening. So uh, I'm going to try to ground you after having uh, heard this inspiring um, space leave, uh, earth leaving talk. Um, this is going to be much more earthbound in a number of both literal and metaphysical ways. So what I want to convince you of is that one of the more important, but also fortunately one of the more solvable problems both in the United States and internationally is uh, now that come on, the internet is technically mature, how do we make sure that everybody who wants to get on can get on and uh, enjoy the benefits of the technology. Uh, I have to make the disclaimer, I'm uh, ignoring for today's talk all the challenges that go along with uh, widespread internet availability, uh, the mis and disinformation and all the other things. That is a subject of a very different talk. So for now, I will simply focus on uh, getting the internet to people uh, in, in a way that uh, reaches everyone. So the three mantras of digital inclusion and where digital inclusion means the uh, ability of everybody to get on the internet and importantly, to use it productively, as in it is not just a technology that you use like plugging a toaster into a wall socket if you want to use internet to your personal benefit. And we all take this for granted. You need uh, digital literacy and other skills to actually uh, use it. Here, I'm going to be focusing primarily on two critical aspects, namely, how do we make sure that the internet actually is available to everybody? And importantly, even if it is available, it doesn't do any good if families cannot actually afford to purchase internet service on in that. So there's an increasing recognition that we need both uh, availability, affordability, and separately also relevance. 
I'll try to give a quick overview of some of the key reasons that even though we are now roughly 50 years into the technical development of the internet, that, that still has left many parts, even of relatively rich countries like the United States, unconnected or connected poorly uh, in that. This is partially a technology problem. I, and we might even be able to use some of the technology that was mentioned in the previous talk, maybe at a somewhat smaller scale than the uh, huge uh, drill that was shown there um, to help with that. But it is largely a policy and again, in a different context mentioned previously, a money problem. Uh, in that, as in we know how to solve the problem technically largely, uh, we just have to find ways to finance that particular effort. Uh, increasingly, uh, the ability for families, naturally primarily low income families to afford internet access is probably becoming a larger problem numerically as in it affects more people than mere availability or not. Uh, it has become clear that while the private sector will continue to play the dominant role in deploying internet, uh, getting it deployed in rural and low income areas and to low income families will likely require not just in the United States, but elsewhere, the active participation of government both at the federal level in the United States and at the state, in some cases, local level as well. Since I only have a limited amount of time, and since my familiarity is mostly in the United States policy realm, I will be focusing on the United States, uh, but some of the issues are, are pretty universal, again, uh, primarily for higher income countries uh, that I will be talking about. But I do want to talk about a somewhat a course distinction between uh, the problem of digital inclusion in the global north and the global south. So in the global north, which I'm roughly shown on the map here, so relatively speaking, higher income countries, uh, you have a widely available uh, fixed uh, or wired broadband, meaning internet access, uh, infrastructure at least partially exists, often built up since uh, my kind of early part of the 20th century or even earlier and not have copper loops going to pretty much any residence and not. Thus the biggest challenge for fixed broadband tends to be the transition from a copper-based infrastructure to a fiber and to some lesser extent fixed wireless infrastructure, not necessarily starting from scratch. The problem tends to be focused on the least connected roughly, and it's obviously I of course a number 10 to maybe 20% of the population, uh, typically upwards of 80% of households have a uh, reasonably good, uh, maybe, overly expensive, but reasonably good uh, internet access. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a large reason for not having close to 100% availability for use of uh, home broadband in particular is that uh, it is too expensive for man many families, as well as issues of adoption, digital literature, di digital literacy, and related uh, issues. And, uh, and there's an increasing focus on new applications, uh, factory 4.0, telehealth, particularly in rural areas, distance learning that we've all gotten to know over the past two years and so on. In the global south, the challenges are somewhat different. Uh, wired connectivity is generally scarce outside cities, certainly. So we are in a mobile first environment. Uh, really almost all the efforts are on deploying higher speed uh, mobile internet access, not as much running fiber to the home. You know, that's really of lesser concern uh, in there. Often 
uh, you have a challenge is to go from 2G to 4 and 5G, uh, and now primarily to 4G at the moment uh, elsewhere, because that provides decent quality, at least basic broadband access to many internet applications. Uh, and that is more likely to be more productive than waiting for fiber deployment to the home uh, outside again, some uh, relatively small and high income parts of those countries. Uh, the challenges tend to be focused on middle mile. And in some cases, as we saw recently, very recently, island of Tonga, well, after the uh, volcano eruption, uh, they're often only connected by satellite or by one fiber that uh, is then vulnerable to disruption uh, for that. As well as uh, interconnection uh, in many such countries, they tend to interconnect via the United States so that uh, if they want to talk to a neighboring country, uh, connection, the uh, internet connection actually traverses the United States or some other uh, near, nearby uh, higher income country before it goes back to a few hundred miles uh, east or west. Uh, uh, Broad-based affordability is a huge problem, even for mobile services, and often mobile services are unaffordable to a large fraction of the population. And emphasis are on things like banking, health, and jobs, which isn't all that different uh, in the global north. Uh, in the United States and other um, countries that have a long history of telecommunication deployment, the notion of what is called universal service is an ancient one by now. Indeed, the term itself is more than 100 years old. So this is a poster from the uh, Bell system in that, that actually pitched essentially its uh, claim to a monopoly status with the promise of providing a service to everyone in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and this was not just a technical issue or even mostly not a technical issue. It was largely a financial issue. Even during the early days of the telephone service, it was far more uh, cost-effective and far more profitable to provide local service in say New York City than in upstate New York, or uh, simply because the distances that you had to cover per customer were so much smaller in Manhattan, and generally speaking, uh, most families in Manhattan and businesses in particular were willing to pay more for telephone service too. And the way that the problem was at least solved so that by the 1950s and 1960s in the United States and many other countries, uh, pretty much everybody as an upwards of 95% of homes had residential phone service was not just the generosity of AT&T and the international brethren, but it was a explicit cost subsidy. Namely, uh, the, the tariffs for a service were designed in such a way that uh, AT&T was allowed to charge more in urban areas and subsidized rural areas. And that mechanism broke down with the introduction of competition starting in 1984 and uh, most uh, deliberately in 1996 with the Telecommunications Act, uh, similar type of developments happened in other countries. But now you could no longer rely on a single monopolist to serve a whole state simply because they were competing with other uh, carriers for the most lucrative customers, and so could not be expected to cross subsidize. So let's, before we talk about solution, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the problem scale and scope is. So if we look globally, um, we have roughly in the past 10 years or so, crossed half the world population in reaching uh, some internet connectivity, largely mobile, certainly. But that growth has actually been slowing down. That is a separate discussion, but we are now reaching 
a country and parts of a country that are harder to serve, where the incremental cost and effort is much larger than it used to be, say, 10 years ago, when you could serve, let's say, largely urban or suburban areas, both in, say, the United States and elsewhere. In the United States, a broadband, home broadband access, and when I say broadband, um, I'm going to be talking about home broadband, not mobile right, 4G, 5G right, going forward, simply because that's the more dominant problem, is very much an income issue. You can see that here, that starting roughly in the 2010s, uh, high income households with the highest chart there, uh, at about $75,000 households, have um, settled, so to say, in the well above 80% of households have it. So there's still households clearly that don't have it for a variety of reasons uh, in that, but it's reaching, you can pretty much assume that somebody who has that level of income has it. If you go down to um, low income households, we're now talking to roughly half of households really only having home broadband access, even uh, as of now. The geographic distribution is also, as you might expect, extremely uneven. Now, this is partially because of the density issues that I mentioned, but it is also because many rural areas tend to have lower income. And in so there are counties, say, that have only a 120 of roughly of the population that is on the internet, while others have well above 80% uh, internet access in that. And as with so many uh, issues, uh, race matters as well. Uh, it is clearly correlated with income, uh, but generally speaking, uh, we have about a 10% difference in broadband adoption uh, by households, by race. Uh, we are roughly speaking, Black and Hispanic households are about a decade behind in adoption and that for a variety of reasons, uh, again, income um, and uh, rural factors, as well as in some cases, actions of the carriers uh, that make it more difficult for uh, those groups to receive internet access, even in urban areas. Increasingly, we are seeing a bifurcation I, it used to be you were typically on the internet only when you had home internet access through, let's say, dial-up modem or cable modem or something like that. Increasingly, we have a large share of U.S. adults who only use the internet through a smartphone. Uh, in that. that is certainly better in some ways than nothing. A, a number of applications can be more. You can use those on a smartphone uh, in that for information gathering and email and so on uh, in that. But smartphones tend to be consumption devices unless you're recording a TikTok video. Uh, and uh, it is really hard to do uh, your homework assignment on a smartphone. Uh, it's hard to do telework. I don't think any of us during the past two years did too many Zoom calls on our phone. We usually reverted to at least an iPad uh, to do that simply because it's just more productive, easier to see slides, for example, and so on uh, in that. And the prevalence of smartphone-only internet access is very much a um, income-driven uh, phenomenon. So this is not necessarily choice. Uh, this is often driven by that's what you can afford. Uh, if we look by geography, is that you have a, a distinction by speed, as in there's a relatively small fraction in the United States that has no internet access whatsoever. Uh, you can, if you have a phone line, you can probably get some internet access, but it is extremely slow. So uh, only about 0.7% have no internet access, even at three megabit uh, in that. But if you get to a more reasonable numbers, you're probably talking about 10, seven to 10%. In that. And this varies greatly that in rural area, that number is up to about a quarter in that. One of the other challenges is that we don't even know the precise numbers. Uh, because of insufficiency and in how we count broadband internet access in the United States, we have this problem 
that we don't know exactly how many people have it, except that we know that statistics are far too optimistic and that the actual numbers compared to the pie charts, they're actually significantly large. So whatever causes. So you could say, well, we should just look at population density, but that's really not sufficient. Uh, what matters is not the population density across the country. What matters is how concentrated the population is uh, where it lives. And so uh, as an example, I've just, uh, even though Australia, for example, and Canada have far lower population density than the United States, by factor 10, roughly speaking, uh, and that it, people who do live in, the, uh, in those countries tend to have, tend to all live in a relatively small part. So that vast stretches, hardly anybody lives. The United States is far more distributed uh, in that, uh, which makes the challenge larger simply because you can't just serve, let's say the, uh, the coastal area in Australia or the strip along the US Canadian border to reach almost everybody. So what's the challenge in a, uh, single slide is that we have these three factors that go together, namely availability, affordability, and relevance. I mentioned that already. They're connected. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's not available. It doesn't matter if it's affordable, vice versa. If it's affordable, but not available, well, what good does that do um, if it's not in your neighborhood? Uh, and clearly, internet content uh, has to be relevant uh, to, as well, because otherwise, even if you might have the money available, you might spend it on something else. Uh, in that. So these three factors, while we talk about them separately, are closely connected. Indeed, we now have a much better idea as to why households beyond those 80 or so percent uh, overall do not adopt is uh, largely having to do with uh, the uh, reasons of cost, again, uh, both relative and absolute cost factors. So in the United States in particular, the availability of broadband is a um, challenge or is driven largely by what happened not in the last 10 years, but uh, the, uh, what happened in the last uh, 20, 30, and 40 years. So uh, in particular, a very large fraction of what we use to get internet service is actually infrastructure that was put in in the 1980s, or in the case of the DSL infrastructure in the 18, not 80s quite, but 1890s in some cases, in the earliest cases, namely telephone wires. So I uh, starting in uh, about the early 1990s, we used DSL modems to carry relatively at the high at the time high speed data, a few megabits. Now maybe a few, at best a few tens of megabit uh, across the same phone lines that has served as voice lines early on, uh, in that. and the evolution of that technology pretty much peaked at about in the year two thousand. In the United States, we actually had also starting in the 1980s with rapid deployment so that about 60% of households had cable television in 1995. No internet, but cable television, which then starting in the late 1990s could be converted with modest effort using the DOCSIS standard into high-speed internet access, relatively speaking. And we now have technology that at least in theory, not in practice typically, can provide um, about a gigabit download um, in that and maybe even more. Indeed, we reached about 80% households about 10 years ago uh, that had cable television and could use that in large part also for internet access. So again, we had the advantage that we had two uh, internet in access infrastructures that largely did not require building physical infrastructure in urban areas and suburban areas. And indeed, uh, turning back to an international comparison, 
it is striking to see that countries that have very similar economic characteristics, as in, for example, they have relatively high income uh, countries uh, in that, have very different breakdowns in how people receive internet access at home. So just to take example, the highest connected country right now, which country obviously is Switzerland uh, in that, but they still get, and this is with Dr. Blue Bar at the bottom, they still get a very large fraction, about roughly almost half of that via DSL, while a country that has a lower per capita income, Korea, famously gets almost all its highest speed internet access uh, by uh, uh, fiber and has traditionally had almost no cable access. While other countries, uh, such as in, uh, say, the United States, uh, to take that as an example, have relatively low, uh, and this is, you know, since we here and not kind of middling in terms of overall broadband availability has a very large fraction, namely the middle kind of wider blue bar is cable and is unique except for a few small countries like the Netherlands in using relying so much on cable service and thus having relatively low fiber deployment compared to other countries. Uh, and, uh, so si similar countries, just for historical reasons, very different deployment, which also means that the challenge of deploying modern broadband of maybe 100 megabits or so are just very different across different countries, even though they have very similar income um, and uh, relatively similar in other ways. Uh, and, not. and this is just a different uh, representation on that, namely the, that the fiber to the home fraction differs dramatically. So how do we improve availability uh, in that? So the first question is, how much speed do we actually need? Uh, and there has for a very long time, in the United States in particular, been a tussle between industry uh, advocates, uh, industry lobbyists, who have traditionally argued that most people don't need a whole lot of them. Uh, so that I'm on four megabits, say, or less than that was sufficient for most applications. Indeed, individually, most applications are shown here. I'm not going to go through that in detail. Uh, even your Zoom call individually probably uh, only uses a few megabits or so uh, in that. But that often has led to deployments of networks that tended to be relatively low speed and then ran out of headroom relatively quickly. So advocates for consumers tend to emphasize that we should not build networks for the needs of today, but for the much higher bandwidth and maybe family oriented aggregate bandwidth demands when everybody is on Zoom or Netflix uh, on that simultaneously. Uh, and so we should aim for networks designed for 10 and 20 years out, not for a network that barely suffices for today's needs. So the definition of broadband in the United States has changed in that. So the last update of that definition is now about seven years old, uh, is what's generally referred to as 25-3. So broadband is defined as meeting the standard of 25 uh, download and three megabits upload. Uh, and now generally speaking, they're all asymmetric uh, in their definition. So that is the legal definition in that other countries have somewhat different uh, thresholds for that. The other issue is that not just have the need for speed increase because of new application, but until very recently, uh, the growth rate in the number of gigabytes per household, and this is the median one, so mean is higher, uh, has steadily increased at about a rate of about 35%, so like a third every year since 2017. Uh, and, uh, uh, that actually, I just updated the, the, the graph of yesterday. It's the first time that I've seen that, and this I assume is pandemic induced, that we actually have seen a decrease. This is for one carrier, which has been publishing this data consistently. So it makes for a nice time series um, that we've actually seen a decrease by one gigabyte. Uh, and we'll see how long that lasts. So when we talk about the technology uh, and 
you, the question I see in the chat is actually an interesting one. It directly, uh, maybe I can address it while I'm talking about this one here. Is we talk a lot about different technologies. Should we use satellite? Should we use fixed wireless? Should we use fiber in that? And the way I like to think about this is not so much speed. You can now do 100 megabits with pretty much any of these technologies. It's maybe a little harder for satellite, maybe a little harder uh, for uh, fixed wireless, but well, you can get uh, 100 megabits and more with Starlink Leos, for example. That's no longer a problem uh, in and of itself, unless you really want gigabits. Uh, the problem that you run into is the gigabytes per subscriber and the gigabytes per square mile or per population. Is generally speaking, uh, for low density, meaning where the density of gigabytes per month or per hour, whatever you want to name or take, is low, satellite is really effective because you can cover with one launch, uh, you can cover say traditionally with a geostationary satellite, you can cover all of North America right now. My satellite is expensive, $10 million, whatever it costs, but my $10 million for the whole United States, it's a trivial cost uh, in that. But those satellites typically can only supply at most uh, a few hundred thousand um, customers across their coverage territory. Now, they just don't have the capacity because it's a wireless link up, wireless link down uh, to make that happen. There's the spectrum available, the power, the antenna size is not just uh, getting more spectrum up there. This is just not possible now. And even the LEO satellites, generally speaking, simply because they don't have the individual bandwidth capacity for because of spectral uh, constraints to do that, they're unlikely to serve more than a few hundred thousand or maybe a million users in the United States. So they are really good for the lowest density areas. They just don't scale uh, to anything uh, approximating a large country. Uh, in, uh, Leos have other problems. Uh, the economics, they, their lifetime tends to be short. So you have to continuously replenish uh, the satellites that keep burning up in the atmosphere because they're, they're in, a, in a dense atmosphere. So they don't last as long. Uh, so they have other economic problems. So for that reason, uh, even though the economics seem attractive, particularly for the geoeconomics, uh, in that they just don't scale. Uh, in that. So we're pretty much stuck I way terrestrial, I want, and there have been other attempts, I won't talk about those, uh, simply because it just haven't panned out in that. So the notion, the question really is, where do you deploy fiber and where do you deploy terrestrial fixed wireless typically, meaning wireless that either, that has a fixed receiver as opposed to mobile or cellular wireless uh, in that. And the cost curves there tend to be more productive, so to say, for fixed wireless at the tail end of it. So the way I like to think of it is, is economically speaking, satellite uh, works best once the dense household density per road mile, which is really the critical number that you look at, not population density per square mile, but for my, how are the households strung across roads, since most people live along roads, unless you're in Alaska. Um, and so that generally speaking, uh, cable and thick fiber to the home are economic uh, to, to deploy for anywhere starting at 20 to 100 households per square, uh, per mile of, um, density, so if you have 100 households per mile of road, um, you can, rural electric cooperatives, that's what the RIC stands for, um, can deploy uh, into lower density areas because they own the electric poles that they can reuse, and wireless internet service providers can go below that. Uh, and then if you're into like one mile, this average separation, you're probably in satellite territory. Uh, in that. Yep. Um, so what is the challenge for rural broadband? So the question is, who is going to build out? Uh, uh, so 
Many of the traditional phone companies, which are known as incumbent local exchange carriers because that's the telephone designation, have no interest in that. The economics just don't work for them. And uh, um, in some cases, municipalities have tried to do that. So above smaller and larger ones, it just tends to be a very small number in the United States, relatively speaking, for both legal reasons. Uh, in 18 states, uh, state uh, governments have prohibited um, building out by municipalities. Uh, one can, one doesn't have to guess far as to who had uh, an interest in passing those laws. Um, and increasingly, uh, electric utilities, uh, electric cooperatives, so these are nonprofit uh, entities that provide electric distribution, not generation typically, to rural areas and were instrumental in connecting rural areas to electricity in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and that they serve a very large number, and many of those have started to upgrade their infrastructure to serve um, copper, I'm sorry, to serve fiber as well as um, electricity uh, as well, but obviously have to string copper, uh, fiber lines in addition to the copper that they have in that. So again, in many cases, the question that has risen traditionally is to upgrade the additional, uh, traditional copper infrastructure, or do you build out fiber? Increasingly, uh, the notion is, except for the most rural areas, you're probably better off doing fiber simply because the bandwidth is essentially infinite uh, by upgrading electronics. And as usual, the big question is, who's going to pay for it? Uh, do you subsidize it once uh, you build it and then you have to, uh, or do you subsidize it forever? And there have been some interesting approaches on uh, like high altitude uh, platforms, uh, apps, or TV white spaces. Generally speaking, they have not panned out. Uh, it's really we're back down to the boring uh, stuff, namely stringing fiber and in some cases running fixed wireless, maybe satellites in some cases. So let's talk about uh, the economics a bit. Surprisingly, even though I talk a lot about constructing networks, even rural networks, a, the largest fraction of the cost of what you pay is actually not the building part of it, that's usually only about 15% of the revenue that you pay goes into constructing networks and repairing and replacing it. It is the operations of it, namely the people you talk to on the telephone after waiting for an hour in line when you need tech support or when you want to cancel your service. Uh, the people who manage the network, the people who repair it when um, it fails and so on. So construction, even in rural areas, tends to be a smaller fraction. And the largest parts, about 70% of the construction uh, of cost of building networks is not the fiber or electronics and all the stuff that network engineers get excited about. It is people climbing up poles or digging trenches uh, in that since my, the efficiency of that has not increased substantially since 1950s, since we had motorized equipment to do the digging instead of using shovels uh, in that. So generally speaking, um, the, oh, power line internet. Yeah, well, um, that was another idea which turned out to be sounded uh, very promising uh, and it was really only deployed in one location in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem was it was never outside the home. I mean, it's pop it used to be somewhat popular and still usable within the home, but it is uh, generally was able to only achieve about a megabit or two in that. And uh, not surprisingly, if you're if you're an electrical engineer, if you're going to use a power line as a conductor for data and you don't have twisted pairs, you've also just built a giant antenna, which just happens to emanate uh, in the radio frequency, lower radio frequency spectrum and absolutely destroyed the amateur radio bands in particular uh, in that because it's all in the, the amateur bands in that. So 
uh, it was extremely unpopular to put a vapor light lay with amateur radio as well as other more commercial radio applications simply because you've just built a, a giant antenna uh, to, uh, that emanates uh, power all along the, uh, the road. So uh, nobody that I've talked to in the last, whatever, 10 years um, is uh, excited about power line, uh, except power lines as a carrier um, or a uh, for fiber that you uh, use the existing poles and in some cases, uh, the actual electric wiring to carry fiber. Uh, you know. So um, TV, TV, uh, yeah, TV white spaces, another one, they've been successful. Generally, they're great for a megabit or two um, on average. They tend to have floundered for anything approaching 100 megabit. So they're great for the first megabit. They just don't work very well in practice uh, for anything larger. You can theoretically do more, uh, maybe 10, but in the US, nobody's going to get excited about 10 megabit internet. It's just not worth the hassle. Uh, in that. So I might have a role somewhere, but I just don't see it. Uh, I am a, as I, this has been hyped in the United States by a number of uh, entities, the number of customers that actually use TV white spaces is a rounding error. Um, as that, it's a few thousand people, best I can tell. Um, and speed is not the, yeah, so capacity is the issue. Um, but TV white spaces has, uh, I mean, you typically get a five or six megahertz bandwidth in that. And even with the most aggressive modulation, which you typically don't get, uh, you get maybe 10 bits per hertz uh, in that. So you get 60 megabits shared among everybody who's sharing the channel. And that just isn't terribly exciting. So um, it's just really hard. Uh, to get significant bandwidth. So for TV white spaces, that's why I said nobody that I know of is uh, in the US. Again, this is el different elsewhere is all that excited about uh, using TV white spaces for bandwidth just available. Because even in rural areas in the United States, the TV spectrum is pretty well occupied these days um, for a variety of te technical and non-technical reasons. And so there isn't really a whole lot of white space available uh, in that. that's different in other countries uh, that haven't done the digital dividend uh, auctions uh, as much as the US has. So it just, as I, uh, I'm not saying this is useless elsewhere in the US. I've not heard anybody seriously propose that as a solution at scale. You just can't get the capacity that you need to make this uh, interesting. Uh, so what's the cost? Uh, yeah, answer later. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so, uh, the, um, when we talk about the cost, it's about 50K per mile. So, again, if you only have 10 households per mile, I am taking 10K uh, and 5K per household. Uh, that's a lot of money to spend. Most households are unwilling to do that. Okay. So, how do we pay for all of this? Um, in the US, and this is as far as I know, the United States is the only, or maybe one other country or two, but it's extremely unusual that it's doing that way. Namely, we pay a tax that is collected through the phone bill, uh, about 25 to 30% on long distance uh, calls, which collects about $8 billion a year, which is then used for um, High cost, which is for rural areas, for E rate, which is schools and libraries, lifeline, low income, and rural healthcare, which is a small amount, uh, two carriers and schools. Uh, and there have been a huge number of programs. Uh, this chart is only meant to illustrate that the US government has for many years tried to set up programs to distribute money to rural carriers in particular, uh, with some but modest success. Uh, so if you are so inclined, you can look at your phone bill and uh, you see a fee that is called Federal Universal Service Fund fee, uh, which is usually about two bucks or so per month on your phone bill, uh, both mobile and landline, if you still have a landline phone at home. And that is used to pay for these things that I mentioned earlier. So it's a uh, special taxing mechanism, even though it's called a fund. It's really a tax. Uh, 
So uh, there have been uh, programs that uh, traditionally just handed out money to carriers. More recently, there have been auction models uh, that I uh, would um, be allocating money to the entity that was willing to provide that service at the lowest cost uh, in that. So kind of a, what's called a reverse auction. So every um, multiple carriers could bid on um, a, a particular part of a state and would get the lowest bidder, uh, would get uh, the subsidy and would then build out with a weighting of the bids by speed. So you, if you bid a low speed, you had to bid lower than if you bid a fiber connection. And so that fund um, was auctioned off in 2020. And you can see roughly uh, that which areas ended up being covered. So it's kind of little blotches all over the United States. More recently, uh, very recently, uh, the uh, multi uh, $100 billion Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act that Congress passed. Uh, one of the large components is a component of 42 billion, which is uh, one of the largest broadband investment ever uh, that will be doled out through a part of a Department of Commerce, NTAA, uh, to the states, which will then I handed out to providers that offer to offer services uh, in unserved or underserved areas. And first, they'll uh, spend the money on areas that have uh, no 25-3 broadband, and then uh, any money left over goes to areas that have some broadband, but relatively low speed areas uh, in that. And almost all of it is going to be fixed wireless or fiber. It's not going to be satellite uh, in particular. In that. Before they do that, they have to gather data on uh, the availability of broadband uh, that Congress mandated that. Uh, so every street location, every home, will, there will be a giant database uh, being set up as we speak, uh, to document every street address uh, and every geographic area for mobile services, whether they have uh, broadband available, which doesn't exist uh, today. So let me talk very briefly before I run out of time completely uh, about the other problem, namely how do we ensure that low income households have access to phone services and data? Starting in 1985, the FCC set up a low income program, which is sometimes known as Obama phones, which is a misleading um, name for it. But it's a subsidy where currently, if you are on a, a, a participant in one of the federal low income programs, such as uh, food stamps or Medicaid in particular, you get a uh, phone service subsidy of $9.25 per month, which usually means you get a free uh, service of some number of voice minutes and these days about four gigabytes of data in that. So uh, companies like TrackPhone and others provide that service uh, to low income consumers. You have to prove that you get one of those um, uh, services like uh, Medicaid, and then you're eligible to, to so Lifeline, even though it is a free service, has not reached most eligible consumers. It's not well known. It's often quite difficult to qualify that. Uh, so in that sense, it has been a modestly successful mechanism for reaching, uh, providing basic internet access and voice of service to low income households. There have also been some attempts, uh, this is Comcast uh, successful uh, model with internet essentials, where if you are low income, uh, you can get a service for $10 a month. Uh, COVID changed that thinking. Uh, it was the notion that you uh, that broadband was a luxury and that it meant if all you needed was email, you could just do it on your phone, truly was no longer sufficient uh, in that. So, you had this issue that you needed broadband, particularly for students, so that they could go to school uh, and uh, participate in any kind of education uh, in that. So Congress set up a program uh, that uh, was called Emergency Broadband Benefit that provided a subsidy during 
uh, during the uh, early uh, months of the year of the uh, pandemic. And that has now been replaced by a more permanent program called the Affordable Connectivity Program, which provides a 30 month subsidy uh, to eligible households uh, in that. And that program seems to be just started, but seems reasonably successful uh, in that. And, uh, if you work for or are connected to a school, for example, uh, it's one of the things that you could and should do is make students aware, uh, aware of that. You don't have to be a citizen to get it. Uh, if, you're, if kids receive uh, nutrition assistance at school, school lunches, uh, their families are uh, eligible for uh, that uh, subsidy. Uh, so let me conclude. Um, in general, we have started to recognize for many years that getting access to broadband is no longer just a luxury. It is as vital as getting access to electricity and drinkable water and, uh, and other basic services. And so the three challenges have been Availability, primarily in rural areas, affordability across the United States for uh, low income households, and relevance, namely for people who may not know that and how to use the internet and what to use it for, uh, to train them to that they can use it for education, health, and uh, job opportunities. The economics of deploying to both low income and rural households mean that government have to step in in many cases to do that. Uh, waiting for uh, private uh, interest is you're gonna wait a long time, many cases. Uh, so the challenge is who should subsidize these high and low uh, cost and low income areas? Should it be fees or should it be taxes? How should this be done? That's gonna be one of the challenges going forward. Um, also from a technology perspective, how do we ensure uh, that the cost of these networks is as small as possible because they're going to be subsidized by all of us as taxpayers. Uh, and with that, I'll turn to, assuming we have some time available, I see all the questions popping up. I uh, let Ashutosh uh, prioritize the questions. Thank you, Anning. Uh, let's give a big hand to the speaker. So um, I know, uh, Henning, uh, you had a long class today in the evening and really appreciate taking <laughs> Uh, precious time, um, but this is appreciated by all of us. Um, I, I know you have been answering some questions. There has been some comments, question, and people have any questions, please uh, put it in the chat box. We are also saving um, those. Uh, so one on comment is, uh, does Henning predict the death of the internet, internet transit, since most of the traffic is increasingly going through the large scale operator? Um, that's a somewhat separate topic. That is certainly the case. I, I, one of the challenges going forward is that the economics for uh, backhaul operators uh, are becoming increasingly challenging. Uh, what is now happening, however, that uh, they are really surviving not on classical transit, but on uh, interconnecting data centers. So most of the money that are made by providers is that. And classical transit is, is replaced really by intra-company transit, uh, namely uh, data, uh, long haul data, both trans-oceanic uh, as well as trans-continental operated by Facebook, Google, and, and, other, um, and other big providers that run their own private networks basically. Uh, in that. So th that's a different form of transit. It is not neutral transit in the sense uh, in that that will indeed be uh, challenging, but because of the data centers and since Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft at the moment are not running domestic US fiber networks of, uh, at, at length is that that will probably be the uh, transit replacement. But yes, definitely uh, traffic is moving off transit and the traditional transit model is pretty much dead. There's really only one, two providers left in the United States that are pure transit providers and, and both uh, Cogent and Zao, and both of those are largely subsisting on, uh, on commercial connectivity to data centers, not on uh, traditional transit. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. So, Henning, I know um, there are a lot of study in the FCC uh, broadband when you're up there as a CTO. Um, there is a question uh, here, your take on municipal broad broadband, right? Um, how things have improved or progress in the last few years? Municipal broadband. So that's an interesting one. Um, and let me give me two, well, this clearly is a very long discussion uh, in that. So, like I said, in some states, um, make it very difficult to deploy municipal broadband. But to mind, there are clearly more than half of states where it is possible. But even there, it has not become widespread. I mean, this is the reasoning is again largely economics. Is the it is mind, the areas that are not covered by traditional providers tend to be areas that are either poor or low density. So the economics for um, municipal brand broadband in those areas aren't all that great to begin with, too. So you have the same problem. Um, and often what tends to happen is when a what, where municipal broadband is getting built out, then you have, since this takes a while, uh, the incumbent provider now seeing competition says, hey, I better upgrade that particular city to higher speed or fiber or whatever. So by the time the municipal broadband network is built out, you then have a competitor, a private sector competitor that would not be building out elsewhere. Often many of the incumbents don't build out higher speed until fairly recently, but sensing competition very well. Uh, in that. So that makes it financially somewhat risky. Uh, what's been happening is that uh, uh, there's now a lot of discussion about hybrid models uh, where, say, the fiber infrastructure is maintained by the municipality. That model has been very successful in some European countries where the electric utility owns the fiber of a conduit, but the actual service is provided by uh, a private or typically several private uh, operators on top of a shared municipally owned uh, infrastructure. So that's my attempt to make it sh uh, as uh, a short version as more to be said on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think we'll just take one more question. Um, there are a lot of interesting questions. This is something um, I remember you gave a talk at the Future Network Initiative webinar about Wi Fi. Uh, so, this specific yeah. question again, um, we are working with a startup called Mess. Uh, it looks like it was set up just to take care of uh, you know this access to everybody. So they have been successful in providing Wi-Fi in public spaces because they are purely long range wireless. It's much cheaper to put solar power Wi-Fi on a pole. So they appear to have solved the multi-hub wireless and can provide wireless in a mile away from a fiber link. So you have any take on that? Yeah, so, and again, I'm not, um, I, I, I would never, but more technologies uh, for particular niches are always a good thing because there's almost for any technology, uh, let's say uh, with the exception maybe a power line wireless, which uh, has really only found a niche inside the home, actually quite a useful niche inside the homes uh, in that, uh, that almost any other technology is useful somewhere uh, in that. So the question that is more interesting is, which densities can these mesh technologies serve well? So the physics remain that generally speaking, each mesh link uh, that you're going to have, again, particularly in areas that are low density, you're going to have these mesh links several miles apart. Otherwise, if you're denser, then you're probably in fiber territory. Um, so you have at least a mile or probably several miles apart. So you're talking on maybe a gigabit uh, link between them. So now you can do all the mesh magic. You're gonna be constrained. You have a backhaul link of a gigabit. It's just, come on, it's just physics. I mean, you're not going to get more. So that's great. Uh, gigabit speed isn't bad, but that gigabit speed is gonna be shared among whoever is connected to that. As long as you only have one household or maybe 10 households connected to each node, that's all great, uh, and then you get still get 100 megabits. But if you now have 100 households that have to share that backhaul link or that mesh link, then you're getting into the data uh, volume problem that I mentioned earlier. You're not speed constrained 
really in the sense of the raw physical layer speed isn't your problem. The problem is you run out of gigabytes during the peak hours or uh, that you just don't have enough capacity to do that. So I find mesh networks to be a good overlay. So for example, Brooklyn has, is deploying a mesh network, but we're talking a few hundred customers here, a few thousand customers in that. It's great for recovery networks. Uh, so we build a mesh network for a DAPA project uh, in that as part of their restoration type of exercises and networks for that. It's just not likely that it's going to deploy in, uh, at scale enough. The other problem, and this is something that people didn't appreciate for DSL and to some extent for cable, is that if you have, what you want to avoid is having active infrastructure in hostile areas. Hostile, not so much because it's somebody it's under army occupation, it is because you're operating an environment where if you have towers or particularly on poles, uh, people literally shoot at it in rural areas. It's a big problem. Uh, use it for target practice. Uh, it's uh, after every thunderstorm, some number of those things are going to come down. You have to replace them. Uh, and uh, uh, ice and other weather is not friendly to uh, these type of electronics. So the cost of maintenance of these active elements in particularly low density areas where you need a fair number of them is pretty high. So often what people have found is that the initial deployment cost for these wireless networks, particularly dense, wireless, relatively speaking, dense wireless network, not just a big tower on a hill, is, is, is low, um, cheap electronics, or cheap installation, but the maintenance cost over time tends to be high and reliability tends to be low, uh, simply because they tend to fail fairly frequently. Uh, and uh, even when you have a mesh network, you usually don't get the density. In that. So that's a long-winded answer. So oh. I would look at more than just for deployment costs, look at the maintenance costs. All right. So, so Henning, um, I think um, I just have the last question to wrap it up. Um, and, and there are some interesting comments in terms of, you know, which uh, country has the highest broadband, all those uh, yeah. can take a look at that. So question is, I'm trying to tie your talk. We have two interesting talks uh, before your talk. Um, I, I know you might have, might have missed uh, uh, Len Kleinrock's talk. Yep. Uh, he talked about the internet, history of internet, you know, how things started. Uh, and now we still have like 50% uh, of the population still do not have broadband access. There are various uh, uh, activities, initiative going on even within IEEE, the connecting the unconnected. Um, so to sum it up, right, if you see the wired, wireless, now 5G and 5G beyond 6G coming in, so how do you think uh, all this put together in Wi-Fi as well, right? How do you think we can really solve this problem of connecting the unconnected or the problem with digital divide, right? I mean, your talk is digital inclusion, which basically tries to take care of the problem of digital divide, right? Yep. Um, so what do you think? I mean, do we have prediction five years, 10 years from now, we can see 90% of the people will have penetration broadband? Is that so, something you predict? I could have, yes. I mean, I, I suspect, and the question will no longer be in many cases, will there be physical availability? I mean, where Leo's and some of the other and widespread availability of 4G and 5G, there will be, come on, there will be uh, some density of bits per square mile pretty much everywhere, except maybe in the most remote polar regions or something. Uh, in that. But uh, everywhere else, you will have it. So the question is no longer directly as in, will there be uh, broadband or some internet access? The question is, at what cost and what speed and what is the most appropriate technology. And so what I would see is that instead of arguing which is better, Leo's or Mesh or whatever, I, I would I say we should be, uh, as engineers, be uh, clear of the trade-offs that one makes for these type of uh, systems. Um, what are the design consideration? Where are different technologies most readily deployed? 
And in particular, this is where I think uh, the emphasis is only really emerging recently is, while it's all great to design I mean, wireless physical layer systems, and mesh, satellites and all that, all necessary. Like I said, the vast majority of the cost is in the operations of networks. And so automating both the network operation and particularly for fiber, like I said, is a, uh, I have in a different talk that I gave, I, I found out when I was preparing for it that it actually costs less simply because labor costs were lower to deploy uh, the original network of copper lines to provide rural electricity in the United States in the 1930s when I mean, they were, well, machinery was far less developed and we had no GIS systems and any of these other technologies than it costs today to run fiber. Simply our productivity in stringing stuff on poles has not increased. So there's a really great opportunity. Um, and I wish uh, the boring project, instead of tunneling under Las Vegas, would tackle that particular problem uh, uh, to uh, automatically provide robots that deploy fiber uh, in that because we're doing that at, at efficiency that is hasn't increased much since the 1930s. And, uh, so there's plenty of technical opportunity, but there may be as much civil engineering opportunities as there are, um, let's say, uh, electrical and engineering and computer science opportunities. Thank, thank you, Henning. I think uh, this interesting discussion, hopefully you can come in person and give us a talk. So with that, I think that was our last talk and I'm, 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 I'm amazing to see people are still there. Nine o'clock is, we call it midnight seminar series. We used to do that in Telcodia research, I remember that. Uh, so with this, uh, um, you know, a token of appreciation, this is the ACM Baltimore chapter inaugural seminar. And I have with my colleagues here, uh, token of appreciation, I'll just uh, have this virtual plaque for you, Henning. On behalf of ACM Baltimore chapter extends uh, its appreciation uh, to Professor Henning Children for delivering the inaugural invited talk uh, at the Baltimore chapter inaugural seminar 2022, Laurel, Maryland, uh, February 24, 2022. And this is a new building. Uh, I know you have visited us before. Uh, so next yep. time you come, uh, uh, please visit us again. Um, so with that, uh, again, let's uh, thank Henning. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Henning. Uh, again, uh, appreciate your talk.